last December, we traveled to the moon for the last time in this generation, they say, for the last time ever, uh, others say. Those others were among the skeptics who are with us in every generation. They question the usefulness of the first landing on the moon and would certainly question the usefulness of any further landing on the moon. They will take what they want to know about the moon from Kurt Vonnegut rather than from astronauts. Alan Shepard, Jr. was, of course, the first American in space. That was on May 5, 1961, a few hundred miles from Cape Canaveral to the Bahamas, at an altitude of 115 miles at a speed of 5,000 miles per hour, a flight of less than 15 minutes. But it was an exhilarating moment in American history, the more so because it was generally assumed that the Soviet Union had permanently won the space race. Before the decade was over, the Soviet Union looked, by contrast, as if it was using paper rockets propelled by rubber bands. Admiral Shepard was one of the men who made all that possible. He was born in New Hampshire, the son of an army colonel, and went to school there. He went on to the Naval Academy at Annapolis, fought in the war as a pilot, went on as a test pilot, was selected for the exclusive astronaut program, and was finally designated as the first man to fly in space. Ten years after he space jetted from Florida to the Bahamas, he commanded a lunar landing mission, Apollo 14, to the moon. He was the fifth human being to walk on the moon and the first to practice his golf shot on the moon. <laughs> I'd like to begin by asking Admiral Shepard if there's a sense in which he and his fellow astronauts feel let down by his countrymen. No, I don't think we feel a sense of being let down, Bill. Of course, as you might imagine to us, space is a very important thing. It's a very exciting thing. It's uh, certainly the most exciting thing that's happened to me as an individual. And I think beyond that, uh, perhaps the most exciting thing that's happened in our generation. And I think that if you view something that has this much excitement, particularly at the outset, uh, when the, uh, these exciting trips have been made, and one moves into an area where the application of science and technology become better known, uh, become more everyday, then you, one would sense a feeling of, uh, of a loss of interest. By this, I don't mean a total loss of interest, but certainly from the days of the very exciting trip to the moon, from the days of the very exciting first rendezvous, or even the very first flight, we find ourselves in a position perhaps of more maturity, but certainly in a position where there is less excitement. And I think this probably is the main reason for the lessening of the interest in the program. And I think all of us sort of feel that way. I think all of us, perhaps it's rationalization, but I think all of us sort of try to explain the lessening of interest in that fashion. Well, I, 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 suppose, um, I suppose if somebody walked across Niagara Falls in a barrel, uh, or I guess you can't walk across in a barrel, can you? <laughs> went over Ni Niagara Falls about every day, it would cease, it would become sort of a, a banal. Um, and uh, in that sense, I understand what you mean. But um, as you know, people have attempted really to philosophize their tedium here. Mm -hmm. And what uh, a lot of people are saying is less, okay, it has become a rather punctilious exercise than uh, that uh, uh, it is a misallocation of human energy. Uh, but this, I take it, you're not in sympathy with. Well, I think there are always going to be people that uh, say it's a misapplication of funds and a misdirection of energy. I think that uh, we will always find this type of uh, differing opinion. You mean about, among clods? About, no, about, among anyone who, uh, who is uneducated, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the other hand, we do find uh, in our contact, in our direct contact with people, and the meetings which we attend, the, the groups that we address, and so on, and uh, uh, in particular with the Congress, we find uh, a good understanding of the long-term benefits of the space program, of the reasons for technology, what they can do for human beings and individuals as the years go by. And in fact, our budget, although it's less than we'd like to see it, uh, gets good response on Capitol Hill every year. So. And what is the principal selling, selling point uh, for your budget? I mean, what, what, what points uh, would you stress if, if you were appearing 
before me, let's say, as, as chairman of the uh, Appropriations Committee? Well, I think we'd, of course, have to stress the importance of the MAN program, because although that does not take all of the budget of the Space Administration, as you probably know, it's the one that receives the most publicity and the most notice, and therefore is the most criticized. So we certainly start out by, by saying what man can do in space and why we feel, because he has the capability of exercising judgment, uh, because he has the capability of being flexible to some degree, uh, why it's important that we have a certain portion of our space missions be assigned to the manned operation. And I think that the recent Skylab mission, which was supposed to be 28 days of blissful experiments and turned out to be 28 days of a cliffhanger, mm -hmm. probably uh, demonstrated as much as, uh, as graphically as any of us could how well man can function uh, in space, not only the crew on the ground, but those men on the Earth that are responding to the various emergencies that come up. And I'm sure that none of us would have liked to have written the script that way ahead of time because it was a real, it was a real exciting mission all the way through. But nonetheless, it did demonstrate, I think, very graphically what man can do in space. But you, you're distinguishing then between uh, uh, financing uh, manned operations in space and uh, wholly automatic uh, operations uh, in space. Is there a difference in the in the character of the reception by Congress to the two? Uh, or or is the, is, has the difference exclusively to do with the higher cost of manned operations? No, I or think I was really only answering the first part of your question. I see, I see. Uh, because uh, that is where the most criticism arises because it's the most publicized. Now, for example, we, get, we find, at least to my knowledge, uh, virtually no criticism of the weather satellites, virtually no criticism of the communication satellites. Uh, virtually none in areas of the scientific probes in the solar system. These are expensive, relatively expensive uh, vehicles, but they don't seem to, to get the criticism that the MAN program does. Is it because of the, of the obvious uh, um, uh, utility of them? Uh, I suppose if you could find a satellite that would make all overpopulated males sterile, they'd like, there'd be no objection to that, would there? Uh, <laughs> Well, as a matter of fact, I'm glad you brought that <laughs> back yeah. in the laboratory. <laughs> uh, is, 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 it, is, it, is it because the I imagination is short and, and they, they want to see the immediate uh, usefulness of each of these I think perhaps you just hit on it, really, that, that, for example, a communication satellite is much easier for the layman to understand. And certainly, uh, for those who have to pay their phone bills, uh, can see where it's helping them directly. And I think uh, with respect to the weather map, I think it's probably become a matter of course now for, for all of us to turn on the television and see a satellite weather map. It means something much more directly to the individual. That perhaps is the real key to it. To well, is, 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 um, uh, is, is there a, a diminution in the kind of uh, scientific optimism on the basis of which uh, America has characteristically been prepared to invest in research without a particular knowledge of the consequences of that research. Is this something that has happened during the past uh, uh, 10 years? Uh, and, and if so, what are the consequences of it in terms of your kind of enterprise? I think it'd be awfully hard to generalize an answer to that question, Bill. Uh, if you talk about research with respect to the medical needs, certainly I don't see too much resistance there. I think you'll agree that uh, that here again, this is something which people can immediately relate to. Uh, they can see friends or relatives or perhaps even themselves needing or being benefiting from this kind of, of medical research. Uh, research for military weapons, uh, I think we find a lot of resistance to that because of what it implies. Uh, you mean people who feel that military weapons shouldn't be unfriendly? Right. Mm -hmm. Now, if you talk about uh, research with respect to the space program, I think uh, I generally would say that uh, we find favor with it. As I said before, we have critics, but I think generally in our associations with the Congress and with the people in the country that they generally understand what it's for. And there is general, general support for it as, a, as a opposed to a diminution of effort, which you just mentioned. I just don't, frankly don't see that. Well, <clears throat> the, uh, it is true, is it not, that two uh, planned flights to the moon were, were canceled. Were they canceled because it was assumed 
that two more landings would be redundant, or was it cancelled, uh, were they cancelled uh, in recognition of, of that kind of financial and philosophical pressure? I really think it was a combination. I really do. Uh, so you, were, you, were, you, you yourself were <coughs> all that disappointed by the, those cancellations? Well, I think we're always disappointed when we can't do as much as we'd like to, as much as we've planned. I think that's probably true of, uh, of in everyday life. If one has a plan, which he's so carefully thought out and he's not able to complete, I think it's always a disappointment. And certainly we personally feel that kind of disappointment. But beyond that, the decision, I think, really was a combination of the need uh, to reduce the funding to an acceptable level, to a lower level, plus the fact that a tremendous amount of data had been accumulated, in addition to the fact that uh, only one of the landings uh, the, that we tried was unsuccessful. In other words, a lot of data came back uh, that we really hadn't been able to expect to get. So I suppose you might say from uh, one standpoint, these two flights were sort of safety flights. Mm -hmm. uh, had we had more casualties or more difficulties, they may have, may have flown anyway. But I think it's a combination of, of needing to reduce the amount of money that was being spent uh, and the combination of a tremendous amount of data which has been brought back and which is still being sent back from these successful six linings which we've had. Well, do, you, do, do, you, do you feel uh, yourself uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a scientist and as a, uh, an adventurer a, a kind of philosophical commitment to, to explore that which is there uh, irrespective of what the consequences of that exploration might be. Did you feel that uh, urge to, to simply do something because it hasn't been done before? Or do you feel, uh, do you feel a prior uh, requirement to justify that on the probability of its usefulness to society? Well, I think probably if you'd asked me that question uh, 14 years ago, I might have given you a slightly different answer than I'm going to give you now. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, this probably, uh, an answer to this question is probably a, a function of an individual's age where one, in order to achieve an objective, is perhaps willing to take a little more risk at a younger age than he is uh, as, he, as he matures. Um, That's a very honest answer. As, as regards uh, the <coughs> risk factor, but as regards the social factor, uh, is, it, uh, is, is it your opinion that society ought, uh, ought corporately uh, to, to back an enterprise uh, even if it is not uh, uh, obvious, what, what will be the uh, realizable benefits? Well, I think I'll have to answer that uh, in, this, in this vein, that I, I don't automatically buy uh, that kind of research, that kind of investment. I think that I agree with the fact that, getting back to the moon again, that we have a tremendous amount of data that we have a lot of rocks that are being sliced up in very minute particles. As a matter of fact, this is a, a universal effort. I don't know whether you knew it or not, but uh, hundreds of, of scientists around the world are involved in the process of looking at uh, these, uh, these specimens that are brought back, not exclusively those uh, here in the United States, and the data that's being sent back from the surface of the moon. Now, you, you, this, it seems to me, I look for some kind of an analogy which is easy for my wife to understand, for example. The only one that I've been able to come up with is one which uh, says, well, the moon is sort of like, uh, like Antarctica. Uh, you know, first of all, that it's there. Then you discover you can mount some kind of a minimal effort to, to get there. Uh, then you can find uh, people who are willing to spend uh, time in this hazard environment for uh, experimental purposes, for scientific purposes. And then you sort of fall back and say, all right, I've learned this much about the South Pole. Do I want to go down there any further? And I think we're in the same phase with respect to the moon. I think we have the first amount of data back from the lunar surface that's going to tell us a tremendous amount of the geology of the moon, its relationship to the geology of the Earth, how the two are related, how we can better determine what's going on on the Earth. Uh, the, the, uh, the fact that the moon is is circling the Earth and examining the magnetosphere, for example, which protects us. We don't know too much about that. The data is still coming back from the moon circling around sampling the magnetosphere. These are the kinds of things that we have to assess in the next five or six years. Now, I can't honestly say what's going to be the answer five or six years from now. Do we, in fact, want to go back to the moon again? Perhaps the answer will be no. Perhaps we don't want to go back for 100 years. 
Perhaps we don't want to go back to the South Pole for another 50 years. Mm -hmm. That's the same kind of analysis. And I, so I really, if you say, should we say, all right, in 1985, automatically fund uh, $3 billion annually for uh, the second expedition to the moon? I would say I couldn't give you an honest answer. If you had to force me to make a decision now, I would say, no, let's wait five years. And uh, would that reasoning apply to, to Mars? Oh, I think so, yes. I think that the effort uh, to Mars and Jupiter and Venus now is minimal effort. I think that's the way it should be. I think that we're just at the point now where we're really finding out what's going on in the solar system and, uh, and how it's going to affect us here on the Earth. And I think for the moment that the minimal number of probes that we're sending now has to be adequate for the science that we get back from it. Well, you, you, you mean there is, there is so much left to assimilate from what uh, you have um, uncovered as a result of your present flights mm -hmm. that it would, be, uh, it would be reckless to proceed to, uh, uh, to Mars or to Jupiter or to Venus uh, in advance of the assimilation of these data? Well, it wouldn't, be, uh, it wouldn't be reckless from the standpoint of safety. I think, for example, in 10 years, we could build a system to put a man on those, on those planets. But I think it would be reckless from the standpoint of expenditure of funds at this particular time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from the respect to the return that one would, would, would expect to get. I've tried to isolate, uh, I'm trying to isolate, I guess, the, the adventure uh, from the scientific uh, uh, payout. Oh, take, take, for instance, the matter of, of the Antarctic which you just mentioned there. Uh, expeditions to the Antarctic were, as we know, frequent. But it was, uh, a, there was a compulsion, which was extra scientific <coughs> character, to actually land at the South Pole, mm -hmm. both the magnetic South Pole and the geographical South Pole. It was of zero uh, uh, scientific interest, as far as I know. It was purely of, uh, of, of, of human interest, because you could discover as much as you needed to discover about South, uh, about uh, Antarctica by falling a few miles short of it, as, as in fact one or two of those people did. But it was the consummation uh, of that that uh, drove a great many people. And I'm asking you whether drives of that kind ought to be socialized projects or whether they ought to be completely individual. Well, I'm not quite sure I understand how you'd socialize them. How do you, how do you, it has well, to be it, the it drive be the public funds. it has to be the... You didn't need public funds to get somebody, to finance somebody to discover the South Pole, right? Mm -hmm. But you certainly do need public funds, as far as I can gather, to uh, reach Mars. Oh, yes. Now, what I'm asking you really is, uh, is there a nexus between the spirit of individual adventure and the resources of the state? You did need Ferdinand and Isabella, or so it was generally assumed during the 15th century, in order to finance that particular uh, expedition. Is, is it your notion, or is it your idea, that the great adventures of this kind in the 20th century have got to be socialized adventures rather than individual ones? Oh, I, uh, I really think so. When, when, when one uh, assumes what the total cost of these things are going to be... Uh, you you can't charge it to Heinz 57, though. Yeah, it's pretty tough. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can see uh, getting back from the, the solar system, uh, getting back from the moon and focusing on what we're doing now in Skylab and uh, what we're planning on doing in the shuttle spacecraft in the next uh, eight, five to eight years. I can see evidences where uh, private funds uh, will, be, will be utilized and uh, where people will be, be anxious to conduct experiments. Uh, As they have been on the communication process in space and so on. Yes, and I was thinking, of course, of the of the communication satellite as an example. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, well I uh, think as long as you're talking in terms of a far out, uh, and maybe we could just say to try to synthesize it a little bit, is something which is pushing the boundaries of the limits of men and machine, then I, th I think that you're probably going to have to, to use uh, uh, the resources large of the state. funds and the resources of the state and government to do it. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> is there, um, uh, somewhere along the line, Arthur Schlesinger said that uh, this, this, this was when uh, uh, his mood was to, <clears throat> to challenge the challenges of the space program. Mm -hmm. I think the mood has changed. But uh, he said that uh, those who disparaged your projects were reminded him of people who approached Ferdinand Isabella and said, uh, uh, you know, what, what's the point of sending this, this madman 
uh, out to uh, uh, traverse the Atlantic Ocean. Now, the, the assumption there was that the discovery of America was a useful thing. But um, how, how, in fact, would we prove that? Suppose this, this continent uh, uh, continued to be simply, uh, uh, simply um, grazing land for a few uh, uh, Indians. Uh, is it uh, establishable that, uh, that the planet would have lost something which was uh, extremely important? Might, might the energies of the planet have, uh, have more usefully gone into the cultivation of reserves and existing continents? I would think not. I would think that uh, had Columbus uh, not made the trip, that uh, certainly the, the overpopulation which would have occurred in the intervening years would have forced them to perhaps just shove off in rafts. <laughs> Instead of well, they, they might have been somehow on a collective effort, that, right? <laughs> <laughs> because, because, because surely by by extension, by extension, the argument would simply give us a few extra acres for a few extra years, mm -hmm. and the crisis is just minutely postponed in, in large historical terms, isn't it? Yeah. But what I'm trying to ask is, uh, is, uh, is, is there a commitment on 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 your part to uh, assuming that the discovery of the unknown that to make palpable that which was impalpable uh, is in itself an obligation of a spiritual kind uh, in a morally active person. Uh, I don't think so. Or there's something uh, in my particular to case. The uh, I, th I think in, in my particular case, I've been a technical man all my life, and I think that. Uh, that I was willing to take the chance in the early days of the space business because I felt that uh, it was expanding the frontiers of the airplanes which I'd flown, uh, that uh, analytically I looked at the equipment and des decided that uh, this was uh, reasonable to fly in. And I really don't recollect having then or now any, any kind of spiritual feelings that, uh, that promote my interest in the program. Well, did you, do you, uh, were you, for instance, a partisan of the SST program in any sense in which you thought of it as a corollary of your commitment to the space program? No, uh, I really didn't have enough knowledge of the SST to, to decide myself whether it was feasible. Uh, I, of course, read the, uh, the press and the reports like everyone else, but as far as being closely associated with it, I wasn't able to... Uh, to be involved in that, and I don't really know whether or not it would have been economically feasible to do it. I suspect it would have been, and I was personally sorry to see that it was delayed. Well, well suppose it were, it were proved that, um, that it were economically feasible uh, in the sense that um, the, the aircraft having been developed, people would patronize it sufficiently to pay the bills, make profit. Uh, do you feel that that is the, the sole justification of it? Or do you consider other factors before making uh, a commitment of that kind? Well, I think there's certainly a number of technical problems that had to be answered. Such as what? Well, such as the, uh, as the noise problem, such as the pollution problem. But I, being a scientist and engineer, have great faith in our ability to solve these problems once we put our mind to it. I think these were peripheral <laughs> issues, although they were important, and obviously many of them had, would have had to have been, uh, been solved. But I, I feel that... Uh, in the final analysis, at least in my own mind, if, if it had turned out to be economically feasible as a part of a, of a structure, that it would have, been, uh, would have been good to go ahead and, and build it. Well, the, uh, do, do you see the 20th century shaping up, as a lot of uh, observers do, uh, as a century uh, in, in which one needs to uh, reconsider uh, a whole series of assumptions which were never reconsidered before, uh, among them that a, a scientific progress, for all that it might be uh, feasible, in the sense that uh, SSTs might be economically feasible, uh, actually require the acceptance of a value system, which is itself challenged by modern technology. Wedgwood Ben, the Englishman, as you probably know, is very high on this point. He was the SST uh, czar um, during the... Uh, during the Labour government's uh, launching of that uh, joint product with the French. Now he's very, very high on this particular point. It's, it's, it's very sort of uh, 
faddish, as you know. Is it something uh, that, that you've made a commitment about, Arnie? You mean personally yeah. made a commitment on the SST? No, 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 no. The, the, the notion that uh, you simply don't challenge scientific progress, you just simply proceed. Oh, I don't, I don't think that scientific progress, uh, progress should go uh, unlimited and unbounded. I do think that we have to exercise some kind of constraints there. Like what? Uh, I, I really have searched for the answer to that for a long time, whether or not uh, the money itself is the proper constraint. I don't know. Uh, whether it's a, whether it's a question of saying, all right, what we're doing now, we can make useful to humanity seven years from now or five years from now. Well, that's the way to assess it. I really don't, I honestly don't know what the answer. You got to ask yourself the question: What's to useful to humanity, too, don't you? Yes. Suppose, suppose it became, uh, uh, in our lifetime or in our children's lifetime, possible to uh, pioneer medical science to the point of infinitely prolonging human life. Uh, would this be an example uh, of something that you have thought through to the consequences of? I've given that considerable thought, too. <laughs> and frankly, I don't know what the answer is to that. I think that this, this is, has to be a, a question which is discussed for a long time before one decides whether one should proceed. I think the research should proceed. But uh, you see, scientists generally are not uh, equipped to do anything more than than develop their own particular science. No, they're not, they're not professionally answers. equipped. But there's no reason why they aren't morally equipped to be as useful as anybody else. Yeah. Uh, is, there, is there a sense in which uh, you think of yourself as a scientific Luddite uh, prepared to go and destroy certain uh, machines? Would, would we be better off if, if uh, all flying machines were, were destroyed? Oh, I don't think so. Would you entertain so. the proposition seriously? Uh, yes, I, th I think that uh, if uh, you will allow me, we can lump the space program uh, and aviation together. And I think that all of us here have seen what aviation means to us in terms of convenience to our way of uh, living. I think the space program is going to do the same thing in the future. And uh, I think that uh, these are the kinds of uses of machines which I strongly support and would continue to support. Now, as uh, for what it use uh, political divisions of people or individuals put these machines. I think we've seen some bad examples of that in the past. But uh, I don't think that should counter the need to continue to try to develop these scientific machines, if you will call them that. Well, I tend to agree with you, but uh, I, I, do, um, uh, uh, I do think that there is uh, crystallizing uh, a very serious philosophical confrontation between people who, uh, who tend to proceed on the assumption that uh, uh, A, science is controllable, uh, and that B, uh, the beneficences uh, uh, of science uh, tend to outweigh uh, the disadvantages of it. Now, mostly uh, people who take that position uh, are, are up against rather surrealistic uh, critics, people who write science fiction novels about uh, the uses of technology for tyrants and so on. But uh, the criticism I think it's becoming more systematic, and people are asking us to challenge basic assumptions, which are very distinctively American, because America is, is associated as, the, as a, a can-do society, which is achievement-oriented, uh, and is um, highly scientific in its orientation and its enthusiasms. And that's why I wonder whether down uh, uh, in Houston, uh, when uh, with those uh, magnificent uh, uh, keyboards, you are uh, propelling things through space at 17,000 miles an hour. Those questions ever do occur to you? <laughs> yes, of course they do. I think that uh, from a practical standpoint, of course, within NASA, we're, we're fortunate in that we, we have been given a charter uh, to develop space science for peaceful purposes. Uh, and therefore, uh, we're able to direct our energies totally along these lines, and I suppose that that as we go on day to day thinking about these ways to uh, assess the environment, the ecology, and help in the correction process, that uh, we naturally tend to ignore the bad effects of it. And I suppose perhaps there's some insulation there to some degree. But uh, nonetheless, that's the area in which we find ourselves and in which uh, space, although it's a way of life, is really more 
contributing to science and technology than does aviation, which of course contributes to transportation. This is what we're seeing, this is what we're finding, <clears throat> and I personally don't find any quarrel with the direction in which we're proceeding. Uh, we when, when you say for peaceful purposes, is this your formulation or is that in the law? This is the charter of the, of the Space Administration originally in 1958. Well, but don't, don't we believe, for instance, that the existence of the Pentagon is for purposes of peace, and therefore the Pentagon is a peaceful instrument? Well, peaceful scientific purposes is what the phrase reads, I suppose. Uh, it, uh, that, it does distinguish... To but you wouldn't withhold from the Pentagon, surely, uh, uh, discoveries that would be useful to the military establishment, would you? No, we don't. I suppose maybe we should go back to 1957 when Sputnik was launched, uh, and there was a great hue and cry to get uh, the United States into space. And, of course, there were, there were agencies that were vying for the job, uh, specifically the military and the National Advisory Committee of Aeronautics, the NACA, as it was known at that particular time. And the executive branch formed the NASA from the NACA and said, all right, you have the job of going into space for peaceful scientific purposes. And and then, of course, the military was allowed to develop their own missile systems during the same period. And the things but that were... sharing yet, research or not? Uh, or was there a strict division between your scientists and theirs? There has been sharing of information back and forth. Uh -huh. yeah. This isn't considered as, uh, in any sense, traducing your, uh, your charter? No. No, the information is there for the military if they want it. Well, the, uh, the, the, the commitment then to, uh, to a continuation of the space program, uh, is, is it primarily a commitment to the consolidation of that which you have already discovered? Or is it, um, at this point, <coughs> a, a commitment to simply an extension by your know, large uh, forward scientific salience? I think if I have, I think if I have to answer that, uh, uh, in choosing one or the other of the alternatives you propose, that the thrust of the space program for the next uh, perhaps 10 to 15 years has to be uh, the former of what you suggest. That is sort of a pausing to catch one's breath, so mm -hmm. to speak, mm -hmm. uh, to consolidate what we've, what we've learned, to consolidate what we've gained, to apply it uh, to the betterment of our everyday life, and uh, keeping the outward thrust, for example, into the planetary system to a minimum. But then at some point deciding, is it really worthwhile to go to the moon again? And we launch. Right. Yeah. But I think we're talking about a decision which has to occur eight or ten years from now. Now, do you yourself have a, a, a position uh, about the Soviet Union, these matters? Uh, do, do you feel, um, as, for instance, uh, Dr. Teller does, that uh, there, there is really no net strategic advantage in husbanding any of the secrets that you have discovered, would you, um, would you soon tell the Soviet Union everything that you know, or do you think that there are certain things you would want to hold back? Oh, well, I would think that uh, in this particular case that there would be little advantage uh, in not essentially telling the Soviets what we're doing. And I say this because, uh, really, although we appear to be quite a bit ahead of the Soviets, relatively, uh, we find that it's only in rather selected areas, in the areas of miniaturization of electronics, computers, computer techniques, these kinds of things. Uh, and at the same time, there is a considerable amount of effort, to research effort, going on in the Soviet Union, so that if we see a disparity of perhaps only three to five years in the technical level in space between us and the Soviet Union. After all, that's only a blink of an eye mm -hmm. in a uh, civilization of 4,000 years. So that uh, there really is very little advantage, advantage accruing to the Soviets, for example, in the exchange which is now occurring for the joint flight which we're preparing in 1975. Mm -hmm. uh, the technology uh, is there. Uh, the Soviet Union, although it's not as precise and as refined as ours. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, the capability is there. Well, so is, this, is this an argument that, um, that defies the widely accepted generality that um, only uh, uh, a free scientists can make uh, genuine progress? 
Is, is it true, therefore, you that... You mean the uh, one who's free from political restraint? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is the example of the Soviet Union uh, 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 sufficient to contradict the general assumption that only uh, a free scientific uh, uh, research community can be genuinely productive? I would think in the terms of pure science that an individual has to be free. I'm not sure, but what there are a number of scientists in the Soviet Union that aren't completely free in their ability to, to uh, do research. I, pr I frankly don't know, but we've seen evidence of, uh, of a tremendous amount of progress in their space systems. As I say, there really isn't too much difference between our level of capability and theirs. Well, is, it, is, is the answer to that question possibly this, that uh, they are permitted freedom of scientific operations so long as they don't mistake that uh, for ancillary yeah. uh, freedoms? I would think that would have to be it, yeah. Uh, and so long as the work that they're engaged in uh, doesn't fall under any ideological compass, as, for instance, in the case of the biological sciences. Doing the I, would, sir, I would think they probably operate under political restrictions, but they'd have to be social-type restrictions rather than those associated with their scientific projects. So that uh, the theoretically, if, if, if uh, our scientific community were a conscript community, it could also be productive, as productive yeah, as theirs. I don't think so. Uh, Ms. Helene Middleweek is here from London, a former president of the Cambridge Union and uh, competing uh, in England for the seat of Mr. Enoch Powell. Ms. Middleweek? I'm interested to know why it's the action of only an ill-educated clod or a wife uh, <laughs> to question the whole value um, for a society that is putting the resources that the American society was putting into the space program, why it is such uh, a wrong action to question the benefit, the value of that program when there are competing projects, uh, whether they're at the alleviation of, of immediate need, whether they're competing research projects. And I don't find a, a moral imperative uh, to stretch human knowledge further than it has been stretched before. I will perfectly accept that you put that into your argument for going to the moon, that no one's ever been there before, as well as the fact that it may bring you in 15 years' time immense scientific benefit. But I think it's going to be weighed in an equation with what it costs. And if when Columbus had gone to Isabella, He'd said, I, not I need three ships, but I need half your GNP for the next five well, years. Well, that was three ships. <laughs> <laughs> In an imperial nation, and they only had three ships? Six, sorry. I can't imagine why else she had to sell her jewels. <laughs> <laughs> but why uh, it is wrong to question um, the value that you're getting from the space project. And I think part of the uh, skepticism, I think, you referred to <coughs> is because of a subject that was only touched on in, in your conversation, which was the political implications of a program like the space program. And when you introduced effort, you said, uh, and uh, of course, up till then, the Russians had looked as if they were in front, but we took over. And there was a very definite nationalistic reasoning behind going in for that. Now, I think perhaps you may find it justifiable. I'm sure you did find it justifiable. In the same way as uh, an American administration faced with domestic problems might consider that the, uh, the circus of a moon flight was important for national morale. But to say that those sort of issues uh, shouldn't be brought, brought into the open and shouldn't be discussed uh, when something is consuming <coughs> resources at the pace that the space program consumed it and when there are these doubts about it, I, I find very odd when it is a national and not a Heinz 58th project. Well, I perhaps... Uh, 57. Gave you <laughs> two misconceptions. First of all, I used my wife as an example because she is uh, totally non-technical. And let me hasten to say that we have a number of women in the space program whom I admire because of their technical capabilities. Uh, secondly, uh, I think the point should have been made to clear, if it was not, that uh, we are not against criticism. Uh, we're perfectly willing to try to explain our positions in whatever manner that we can. Uh, it seems to me that the, the point here uh, is that, the, that not that we're resisting the criticism, not that we're upset about the criticism, but we're saying that it's difficult for us to explain reasons for science and reasons for technology. Uh, 
one sees today evidences uh, in the medical area, in the area of uh, materials, in the area of uh, communications, examples of things that were done on my flight, which was 12 years ago. It's taken that long for it to become part of our, of our daily life. And that's the thing that makes it very difficult to explain why, why go to the moon. You know, a person looks at a rock, and uh, it's not an, a moon rock is not an attractive rock, only to a geologist. And it's hard to say, well, now, if I'm studying this, eight years from now, this particular geologist and his contemporaries are going to know more about the geology and the structure of the Earth. It's a whole process of explanation, and this is the, the difficulty that we have in explaining why we think it's necessary to continue this kind of, a, of science and technology. But it should essentially be a political decision whether you continue oh, except I think not it a has scientific to be. one. I think it has to be a political decision. Uh, and let me say that uh, the decision that the administration has made uh, the last two years has given NASA only 1% of the total federal budget. I don't know whether you realize that or not. Uh, we get more publicity than that, obviously, mm -hmm. but in a budget of $270 billion this year, NASA's budget is three, which is just about 1%. Even in the high years, it was uh, less than 2%. Uh, during the same time, uh, the, uh, the politicians, the administration, have decided to continually increase spending in the federal budget for areas uh, where social deficiencies occur. And in the same budget in which NASA has one cent, uh, if you add up the money being spent for social problems, social benefits, we come to 48 cents. So it's a relatively small part of the budget. But I agree with you, it has to be a political decision. Dr. Richard uh, Ashcraft is a professor of political science at UCLA. Dr. Ashcraft. Yes, I've listened to your uh, discussion. And throughout, it seemed to me that you, whether consciously or not, uh, disassociated the space program from military purposes, the development of weaponry, and so on. And I wondered whether <coughs> historians always uh, imagine different contexts in which events occurred. And going back to the early days of the space program in which you were involved, and the reaction to Sputnik, and so on, <coughs> how would you react to the statement that the space program, and particularly the way in which the space program developed, was purely a product of the Cold War? It was purely a product of the Cold War. Well, I would take exception to that. Uh, if you're going to uh, assume that that's the total reason for the development of it, I hope that you're not assuming that. But on the other hand, I do say that there's no question about the fact, in my mind, that seeing a Soviet satellite go across the United States on a clear night was a very impressive thing to me. That satellite belonged to another country belonged to a country that I had uh, perhaps degraded in my own mind before that, as far as their scientific achievements had been con had concerned. Well, not just <clears throat> any other country either. It belonged to a country that threatened to bury us. Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm just talking about my, my particular response to that, to that issue. I mean, if it had and been Luxembourg, your response would have been different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure it would. Really? I'm not so sure. But to me, you see, that, that was uh, part of the reason for uh, for the need for establishing our own efforts and our own program and getting it going. So I don't think you can totally disassociate it from the, from the Cold War phase. Would well, you think they would have appropriated uh, as much money, uh, if I understand Dr. Ashcraft's question, do you think they would have appropriated as much money as they did if it hadn't been for the uh, military aspects of the, of the whole space program? Mm, I don't know. I. I really associate... I mean, R Richard Russell's interest in the moon was not that obsessive, was it? Yeah. Uh, I, I really uh, associate these expenditures of large amounts of money, relatively large amounts of money, with the moon landing program. Uh, the budget which was applied to the Mercury program and the Gemini program was relatively small, but the decision was actually made to commit the country to the lunar program in 1961 just two weeks after my flight, the suborbital flight, when the president committed to the expansions of these funds. Uh, and at that particular time, of course, the, the Soviet Union, as far as manned space flight was concerned, was ahead of us. Uh, if I could ahead. just follow that yes, up, sir. yeah. 
I, I heard your answer to a, a related question that uh, Mr. Buckley asked before in technical legal terms, which dissociated the space program from military mm -hmm. uh, research. But uh, perhaps putting that technical legal distinction in a larger context, would you really want to say that um, uh, it hasn't been, the space program hasn't been under a total umbrella of military orientation and that perhaps some of the declining interest in further advances in the space program relate to a de-emphasis of that Cold War uh, mentality? Well, I would I certainly hope so. I, I, would, I hate to spend any more of my tax <coughs> dollar on, uh, on military weapons than we have to. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not a militarist at all. Um, I do think, though, that, uh, that there are military uses in space. There have been and there will continue to be as long as the, there is a need for intelligence gathering and as long as the other, uh, other states uh, utilize space for their for their military purposes. I think we have to counter in this area just like we do undersea and everywhere else. I would hope there'd be a lessening of the effort in, in that direction, but as a result of an overall lessening of armaments and, uh, and military weapon systems throughout the world. <clears throat> Dr. Francine Rabinowitz is a professor of political science and urban affairs at UCLA. Dr. Rabinowitz? I have two times. Uh, two different kinds of questions, one short and one long. You said um, in passing to a question Mr. Buckley asked you about uh, changing values about the uses of science that you thought perhaps in the atmosphere of NASA you tended to not focus as much as others might on the negative impacts of s science on society. Would you approve if Congress imposed on you the need to file an environmental impact statement in the way that other domestic peaceful agencies now doing research are being asked to do that? I would certainly uh, oppose it if uh, we were being asked to uh, file an environmental impact statement in the manner in which it's being asked today. Yes, I see uh, too much evidence uh, for people to rush into the need for the environmental impact statements, and I see boards meeting that are not really qualified to, to make these. Uh, these requirements. What is an environmental impact statement, just uh, for the record here? Well, it's a statement which, uh, at least as far as, uh, at least in one area, in uh, uh, building codes uh, imposed by cities, counties, uh, authorities, where a project is being put in, a uh, building project, industrial, housing, whatever you, what have you, to satisfy a board uh, of the city, of the county, whatever it may be, that the impact to the environment of uh, this particular project will not be detrimental to the overall community. That's what you're talking about, I guess. Well, do, you, do you think that would jeopardize your enterprise? To the way it's those? being run now, yeah. We're just getting into the early phases of it, and uh, some of the requirements being put on industry, builders, developers, and so on. Is there that much stuff just between Cape Canaveral and, and up 150 miles uh, that they're worried about? <laughs> the surface environment we're talking about. No, I was really thinking she about permanent they, stations in space and whether it, uh, 10 years from now, perhaps, we'll be as housewives and wives and public citizens regretting that we didn't ask NASA to tell us about the impact of uh, permanent implants or quasi-permanent implants in space. Are we sort of exhaust and all kind of stuff up, up there? Yeah, yeah I, well, perhaps or, I better or space answer stations, it a different way. I, or satellites. My or answer is not coming th through very clearly. Uh, perhaps I should say that uh, that uh, I'm opposed in today's uh, theater of uh, knowledge of, uh, of the impact on the environment of the things that we're doing. Uh, I'm opposed to a headlong rush into stifling projects purely on the, on the basis that they're going, to con they're going to contribute to the degradation of the environment. I think that we're just getting to the point now where we're starting to understand what we're doing to ourselves in our environment. And uh, I hate to see us rush into something uh, to, to stop a project or to curtail a project uh, on the basis of uh, its degradation to the environment. We're not really sure what we're degrading. Is that, did I make myself clear in that respect? Yes. I now, I'm not against it. Clear. I really am not. But I think it's, uh, it's, it's something which has to be approached with, uh, with a lot of, of 
caution. Uh, analytically, I, and I can see a lot of money being wasted now on, uh, on boards set up to control the environment when their people are really not, unfortunately, equipped to understand what their charters really are. Well, you, 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 you oppose sort of a um, Sierra Club fanaticism about this, but you don't, you don't oppose, do you, uh, the, the notion of attempting consciously to assess no, what is no, the impact? No, that's of, which correct. Is what, uh, I understand that's, that's what Dr. Correct. Rabinowitz is really asking, right? Yes. It's, it's, I'm not opposed to that, no, but I think it has to be done carefully and, uh, and analytically. You're not opposed to it being done by a public agency other than NASA? By any agency. The beer industry, I'm happy to see what they're doing. <laughs> uh, Ms. Middleby? Yeah, I'm, to go back to the question of why one continues uh, a piece of scientific ex exploration. Um, you said that when you were in space for the first time, you could have no idea uh, of the medical effects that were going to take place now, the benefits that are coming. Now, I don't know if the man who split the atom had a vision of Hiroshima in front of him. Uh, do you think there are any sorts of criteria? You said before it was very difficult to determine the criteria on which you explore space. But surely it's of desperate importance to us that if we are not going to say knowledge for knowledge's sake, uh, if we're not going to put unlimited funds into exploration, that we try and articulate, we try and, and explore what the criteria are, and what the, the chances of usefulness to, to create some sort of cost-benefit analysis on exploration. Uh, do you think that this should be a part of NASA's function, or do you think it should be separate from the people who are, are doing the work? Oh, I think it should be separated from, uh, from, the, from NASA. I really don't think it's there. Well, you said a moment ago it was going to be a political decision. Yeah. So, I think so therefore it, it is separate, isn't it? I think it has to be a decision of the people, which is a political decision. Yes, but in answer to the other question, you were saying how necessary it was, that it was scientists who evaluated, that the evaluations were done on some sort of objective criteria. Now, who are going the to be the experts? Evaluators. Yes, well, these yeah. are scientific questions. The, the, the data we need to make <coughs> political decisions no, 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 on. No. It's, are not a it's not data. a scientific question how much smog people in Los Angeles are willing to put up with. It's a scientific question how much will be emitted by a particular yes. automobile. Yes, it's a scientific question. Also, it's a scientific question how much smog people can inhale without fine and how short their life is cut. Yeah, by that, that, that now becomes a biological question. But in between, well, biology is a it, science, in between, I think. Yeah, yeah, sure. But it, it starts sci as a scientific question. It ends as a scientific question. But in between, as with most uh, matters, it becomes a matter of taste and preference, right? People aren't, in fact, dropping like flies in Los Angeles. But there are people yeah, in Los Angeles who are like highly flies. dissatisfied. <laughs> <laughs> well, not necessarily. I mean, they haven't yet. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. Three days and it's killing me. <laughs> I wish I knew the answer as to how to, how to control research and how to, how to define what amount of research had to You see, there has to be, be some be sort of interface between the politician and the scientist on this. You can't say simply that it's a political decision what people will put up with without having, having some data that we must depend on the scientist to provide. Well, this, 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 as I understand it, this is correct. Uh, 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 only if one uh, is prepared to assume that the strategic impact uh, is something that only science uh, is in a position to measure. If somebody says, look, I happen to have tasted the air in Los Angeles and I can predict that anybody who breathes it for 10 years will be dead 10 years later, that is a scientific judgment. And as I understand you, uh, Admiral, you're perfectly prepared to allow scientists to, uh, to make those determinations, but it is something completely different to say, do I or do I not want an SST system uh, if the noise of it is going to reach this decibel level? Right. which is not necessarily yeah. toxic in any mechanical but sense. All I'm saying is that you shouldn't just have a data to say people in Los Angeles suffer from smog. Uh, shall we pay the money and, and take the trouble to stop smog? We ought to be able to say people in Los Angeles who live 10 years are losing one day of their life. And maybe one day of their life we decide is too expensive to save, but if it's five days of their life, then perhaps we think it's, it's worthwhile. But along that vein, the scientists can only tell you how many days of life they're losing, and then you have to make yes, the decisions. Yes, but, but are the scientists even providing that evidence? Do you think we should outlaw smoking? No. 
Uh, you socialists are becoming quite permissive. <laughs> Always getting away from England is only right. <laughs> Dr. Ashcraft, we have time for a quick one. Yes. Uh, uh, I'd like to follow up that question, but get your impression. You've described yourself as a scientist, and I think you also use the word technical man. When you were in the space program, did you regard the political objectives of that program as being entirely set external to your function in that program? Or did scientists and engineers and astronauts and so on play any kind of policy-forming role with regard to the objective? We formed a policy-making uh, role with respect to the technical and the scientific objectives of the mission. But not the political. Uh, but not the political. Unfortunately, we, we find ourselves as, uh, as public figures, well, and we got involved in a lot of political social uh, functions. I'm a bit confused because in response to Mr. Buckley's question talking about Soviet scientists, how would you really distinguish American scientists from Soviet scientists in that regard? Well, they can walk out. In not having any role in, in formulating political policies of which they provide the scientific information, for which they provide scientific information. Why well, is that I, any I think the question was in the context of is, is is he given free role in his particular science so long to as develop he doesn't a cure for cancer or is he saying, all right, right. you have so long as he doesn't intrude into other asset. areas, other areas being mainly political. And if American scientists function according to the same maxim, what really is the difference? Well, but they, they can pull out. If, if Admiral Tupper wanted to resign tomorrow and campaign against uh, Canaveral, he could with impunity. How yeah. many do? Well, he doesn't choose to. Uh -huh. well, could it, it, could you enlighten us on that? I mean, why, why did that never occur to you, for example? You mean to, to, to criticize or to take a public stand or to put yourself in... in in political opposition to objectives that uh, perhaps... You have just 25 second differences. Well, I think that's you very easy. That I just, uh, I'm not a political person, purely and simply. I'm interested in my country and in government, but I'm just not uh, a After politician. All, yeah, that's right. John Glenn ran for the Senate. That's right. We have uh, a couple examples of, of, a of astronauts who have been interested in politics. I just don't have to be one of those. Thank you, Admiral Shepard, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen of UCLA and members of the panel. printed bound copy of this program, send 25 cents in coin to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. That's 25 cents to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. This program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. <laughs>